you're growing up. And other things are changing too. You know what that means. Point Lookout is the fourth add-on brought to the wonderful world of Fallout 3. Each expansion focused on building up specific aspects of the base game to varying success. Operation Anchorage's focus was combat. It took us to the frozen battlefield of Alaska, giving players pure, distilled combat without the pesky penalties that usually accompany unchecked bloodlust. The pit's focus was storytelling. It sent us to a tortured land up north, being suffocated by a cloud of poison and oppression, allowing players to explore Explore a new story where their choices will define the region's future, for better or worse. Broken Steel's focus was extending the main quest. It removed the hard stop that ended the main quest of the base game, and let players continue their adventure while experiencing the fruits of their efforts. Point Lookout is the add-on that set its sights on giving players a wide-open landscape to plunder at will. It considers itself the most mysterious and open-ended Fallout DLC. That wasn't a high bar to clear though, as it's the only one to feature a fully open world. It's roughly 20% the size of the base game's area and is tightly packed with an all-new story, enemies, and gear to unpack. Does Point Lookout have what it takes to stand above the other Fallout 3 expansions? Let's find out as we explore Point Lookout. Grab your mud boots and double barrel boomsticks because we're going swamping in a little place called Point Lookout. Jumping into the game, we wrest control of the wandering loner with a boner, Dr. Donglord, whose name remains as mysterious as the murky swamps of Point Lookout. I genuinely don't remember why he's named that. When we joined his travels, he was at the steps of Galaxy News Radio, having just helped the Brotherhood take down a super mutant behemoth. Dr. Donglord was about to question 3Doc for information about his missing father. Sorry, Doctor. Daddy is gonna have to wait. I decided to taunt Donglordius further by bringing them to Smith Casey's garage, where their dad would be mere feet away inside a tranquility lounger, as I waited for the Point Lookout prompt to come up. When it did, it tells a tale of a riverboat docked at the mouth of the Potomac River that was willing to transport any willing mercenaries, treasure hunters, or adventurers to a land untouched by the bombs and ripe for exploration. Sounds like a great deal. I set off to find this riverboat. The journey would be long and brimming with challenges. Still, challenges build character, and my character was desperate for some building. At just level 6, and a face that looks like this, I knew going in, this would be trouble. My first hurdle was some raiders who made a fool of me. Their army of feral doggos, shooting guns, and missile launchers were too much for me. Round two saw another group of raiders running at me with melee weapons. This was far easier to handle and much closer to what I can expect with Point Lookout, whose inbred swamp folk are also fond of getting way too close. Before I could reach the riverboat, my final test was a group of Talon Company mercenaries holed up at a collapsed building near the dock. I had hoped they would let me slip by without fuss as I proudly wore their signature combat armor. They would have no way of knowing that I wasn't one of them, or that's what I thought. They saw right through my disguise and immediately opened fire. Their missile launchers hit their marks and I had no chance. Instead, I sprinted past them, making a mad dash for the boat. If I couldn't take care of a group of mercs, how could I ever survive the horrors of Point Lookout? The only way to find out is to dive in head first. As I approached the riverboat, I was accosted by a woman named Catherine. Are you going to Point Lookout? I need your help. Pleading with anyone going to Point Lookout to keep an eye out for her daughter, Nadine, who ran away. The boat's captain, an off-putting fella called Tobar, was cheerfully offering passage to faraway lands for anyone seeking fortune or adventure, assuming they can cover the reasonable cost of the ticket. I agreed to let this stranger lock me in his little boat room and ship me off to lands unknown. The base game of Fallout 3 does not have a single soul who has been to Point Lookout and returned to spin their tails. There could be only two reasons for this. Either Point Lookout is a paradise for which no one would ever want to leave, or it's a violent hellscape that, like a black hole, does not allow anyone or anything to escape its hungry, gnashing maw. Whichever way this goes, Dr. Donglord will be ready. He didn't go to eight years of high school to be bested by a bunch of drooling swamp folk. Thirty in-game days later, we pull into the port of Point Lookout. This place is blanketed by a permanent overcast. It feels almost as if it exists beyond the real world. An ominous, pensive emotion walks beside you with every step. Even though it wears a harsh, unforgiving exterior, there is still something far darker below its unsettled surface. Though it was spared from atomic fire, it was all but forgotten by the outside world. But as all roads lead to ruin in the Fallout universe, that didn't stop it from becoming a sh**. 
rabbit hole. It didn't vanish in the blink of an eye like everything else. It was simply victim to centuries of decay. Perhaps there's more to its story than mere neglect. As Fallout 3's most expansive DLC, it has Bethesda flexing its world-building muscles at every turn. As soon as we parked the boat, Tobar was still trying to sell this dump as a gold mine, just waiting to be stripped of its treasure. I know I said Point Lookout was perfect for treasure hunters, but it's a rare day when you get a beacon like that. He points me to the mansion on the hill, with smoke rising from its chimney. It was the old Calvert Place, and one of the few landmarks dotting this nightmare bog. Before I marched right up to its doors to begin the main quest, I took advantage of the open world that has been so rare within the other add-ons of Fallout 3. I strolled down the boardwalk, letting the winds call me wherever they may. This led me to encounter one of the many unique horrors of the mire. What denizens dwell within this forgotten land that my brain couldn't possibly imagine. Just some mole rats. I pushed further inland and stumbled on some pissed off dogs. Still not exactly mind blowing. I'm sure there will be more creative enemies later on, but so far, yeah, not impressed. I found a trader who set their shop up behind the counter of one of the many rigged cardi games on the boardwalk. She offers your typical scavenger affair, armor, weapons, healing items, etc. Including some of the brand new equipment that comes with this expansion, such as the lever action rifle, which I picked up from her. It looks nearly identical to the Lincoln repeater in the base game, except it's chambered for 10mm rounds rather than 44 caliber. This makes it a much more viable option, especially in the early parts of the game when 44 ammo is at a premium. The lever action rifle is exceptionally accurate, and carries a far heavier punch than the hunting rifle. This became my chosen weapon for the beginning of Point Lookout. Now that I've warmed up and gotten familiar with the environment, I headed to Calvert Mansion to kick things off. I followed the main road that winds away from the pier and was immediately distracted by one of the swamp people. This one identified as a trapper and charged at me with an axe. His face expressed an unbridled sense of glee, his lust for blood raging at the thought of fresh meat. I downed him with the lever action rifle and realized what a slog this would become. Every enemy in the swamp is a f***ing tank. Perhaps it's Dr. Donglord being such a low level, or it's something in the water here. Whatever the reason, everyone here is a pain to bring down. That feeling was bolstered when I eventually made it to the mansion. I stepped into a war zone. A ghoul named Desmond was fending off against a group of tribals. I had no idea what was happening, but the ghoul ordered me to help protect him and the mansion. He had cameras placed all around the house that he monitors from a room towards the back. Turrets hang from the main lobby ceiling, or whatever this area is called. I, I don't know mansion terminology. Desmond has employed a group of dogs to fight for him. Tribals burst in through the walls, and we are tasked with cutting them down. This entire mansion defense section felt like it took 15 hours to complete. I had to methodically clear each room of tribals before moving on to the next, all the while Desmond is shouting at me. I had no reason to help him, I don't know who he is. He just assumed I would listen, and I did. I picked up another one of the new weapons brought by the expansion. This double barrel shotgun was functionally identical to the sawed off shotgun of the base game, but you know, not sawed off. That being said, it sucks, especially in VATS, where it seems uninterested in getting a clean shot. I switched back to the lever action rifle because it's the only weapon I had that would actually want to finish this fucking mansion bit. The tribals were taking advantage of my low level by kicking my ass up and down these fancy hallways. Desmond hides away in his little back room with his turrets, dogs, and camera monitors while I do all the hard work for him. He wanted me to block the holes used to gain access to the building by exploding these things. Do that twice in the opposite wings of the house, and we are treated to holding out one last time against the invaders. I've been in Point Lookout for about 20 minutes and amassed a body count in the thousands it feels like. As the dust settled on the epic battle, Desmond and I finally had time to talk. He mentioned that he had the situation under control even without my help. Not hardly. Had it all well in hand, and I didn't even need to use the failsafe. He's an arrogant, pompous jerk, but he's also the only person willing to speak to me with words instead of bullets. He claims the tribals have been attacking his house repeatedly, and he doesn't know why. Rather than apply any effort towards his goals, he demands that I go to the Arkandov Cathedral to figure out the deal with all these tribal attacks by convincing them I want to join their weird cause. With nothing better to do in this forsaken pit of moist hell, I agreed to go to the tribal HQ. The walk over to the cathedral was drab, just a short short march to the north briefly interrupted by some swamp folk down by the river who were in need of a 10mm surprise. So far I was underwhelmed by the world of Point Lookout. It has all the ingredients of a world
world I love exploring in games. It's dark, mysterious, and melancholic. Yet I couldn't be bothered to feel excited delving into it like I was with The Pit or the rest of Fallout 3's base game. It was too monotonous, even for me. It lacked a meaningful contrast from the overwhelming, oppressing darkness. It was dreary and dull like a sea of grey, undifferentiated nothingness. There was no substantive character or charm to connect to. Very few things stood out among the muck. Clearly there is far more to this place than what bubbles up to the surface, but it was more implied than fleshed out. There were some neat touches and splashes of character all across Point Lookout, like the dolls that seem to appear everywhere. Their heads are placed on spikes and their bodies are added like seasoning to brutal rituals. I was interested in learning more about what the swamp folk did with the dolls, but the closest thing I got to an answer was someone being just as confused as I was. Though the underlying beliefs seem quite dark, I'm not sure they're anything more than an empty set of traditions to the Swamp Folk. I remember playing this DLC for the first time and being floored by the new world laid out for me to explore. However, playing it again for this video has left me unenthused and without much to say. It's far from bad though, it's perfectly competent, but missing the distinct personality I've come to expect from Bethesda games. At the cathedral's doors, I am greeted by a voice over the intercom, who says I can't join their club until I go huff some magic fruit and write a book report on the fever dreams I have. If you seek entry, you must be prepared to expand your consciousness. You must prove yourself worthy to transcend. My next objective was to travel to the opposite end of the map. Rather than barrel through the main quest, I decided to savor the landscape and wander aimlessly until I found something worthwhile. My first diversion led me to a shack housing a moonshiner. She was ill in need of Dr. Donglord's help. I was to gather up a bunch of shit to make moonshine. Secret family technique. Been so for generations. Punga fruit, bags of yeast, and fission batteries. I agreed to get what she needed. The punga fruit was easy enough as they grew from every crack and crevice of this swamp. I needed 20 of the wild variety to check that off the list. The bags of yeast were also no fuss as they plopped down just about everywhere, and I only needed three of them. The fission batteries were where I struggled the most, as they are plentiful but prohibitively heavy. Like any self respecting person taking groceries into the house, I was determined to bring my entire haul all at once. This meant having to shed unnecessary junk from my inventory to accommodate the fission battery's ridiculous weight without being reduced to a shambling encumbered mess. The moonshine lady was pleased with what I brought and made a big batch of her special sauce, giving me some as a reward, along with 300 caps. Later on, while walking the seaside cliffs, I found a cave with the lanterns marking its entrance. Going inside, I found a ghoul named Plick, hosting some sanctioned hunting safari, which is a fancy way of saying he'll lock you in a room with feral ghouls for a nominal fee. I gave him his money and stepped into the arena. There were already some other explorers readied up for our trio battle royale. I was joined by Jacob Humboldt, a man wearing a suit and confederate hat, and Rip Smith, a mutton chop master of metal armor. But neither survived the onslaught as the ghouls poured in from the cave walls. I tried to keep them alive as best as I could, but both were woefully unprepared for ghoul warfare. My reward for completing the safari was a unique axe called the Dismemberer. The safari can be repeated every Every few in-game days, but there's no additional reward other than the loot from the ghouls. Exiting the cave and heading towards the water, I came across the USS Ozymandias, a beached research vessel east of the shore on a rocky outcropping. Inside the ship is a key lock safe, which can only be unlocked from a nearby research terminal, which requires me to retrieve soil samples from a cross point lookout to access. There are three muck piles scattered across the swamp, and inside are remote labs to study the natural gas deposits left by the many Confederate soldiers who perished there during the Civil War. The quest is basic and could be more interesting. Just descend into goo pits for research samples and return them to the boat to open a safe with some cool gear inside, including a brand new grenade filled with that Confederate biofuel. With several side quests now knocked out, I was ready to press on with the main story. I took off to find the Mother Punga for a hefty dose of brain-altering chemicals. The path leading to it is a narrow bog lined with mire lurks. I tried to sprint past them to reach the end of the route and start my hallucination. Still, the enemies caught up to me as I fell asleep and clamped at my squishy body until I died. It turns out I need to clear the mire lurks to complete this, but I wasn't f***ing around anymore and whipped out the fat man to send these weird crabby frogs or whatever to radiation town. A couple mini nukes were all it took to remove them from existence. Finally, I was alone with the mother punga fruit. 
fruit, and upon grabbing its seeds, it sprayed me with a mist, rendering me unconscious. I came to and was under the Punga's control. As I retraced my steps back to the entrance, I was treated to a breadcrumb line of poetic, psychedelic hallucinations. There are a series of seven off-putting vault tech bobbleheads, now called Schmalt Tech Bubbleheads, representing the different special attributes. Each of them offers a cryptic, taunting message that sheds light on the insecurities and fears of the Lone Wanderer. The first three bubbleheads are not-so-subtle hints that this wasn't just a harmless trip given by a magical drug fruit. Intelligence says, Tisk tisk walked right into another trap. Exactly how stupid are you? As you approach the second bubblehead, the trees turn to violins, chanting a haunting tune, a soundtrack to your insanity. Strength says, this is one situation you're not gonna be able to fight your way out of. More violin trees crop up along the path. Endurance reads, keep it up, you're almost there wherever there may be, probably nowhere. A giant red saw appears and drives into the ground, seemingly at random. Nuka-Cola quantum bottles descend from nearby tree branches and erupt as tiny nuclear explosions. Ghostly ghouls shriek and gnarl as you pass them. They charge at you, but deal no damage. I shot one of them and it crashed the game. I have no idea if those two things are related. The next few bubble heads illustrate the intrusive thoughts racing through our character's mind. Agility reads, isn't it funny how everyone you get close to ends up leaving? Speaking to how the Lone Wanderer's father was the only family they had in this harsh world, but left them to pursue what they believed was a greater cause. It speaks to Amada, the Lone Wanderer's only true friend in the vault, who decided to stay behind when they both had the chance to escape and it speaks to the Lone Wanderer's mother, who passed away as they were giving birth to them. At every turn, the Lone Wanderer looked to the people closest to them and was denied. The world flips upside down as we enter the following grove, where the next bubblehead perception exclaims, this doesn't look right, not right at all. Thank you, Inner Thoughts, really nailed the analysis there. An enormous sewing needle guides us to the next bubblehead, Charisma. It sits atop an operating table over a skeleton labeled Mom balloons and a party hat stand guard. It reads, blech, if my kid looked like that, I'd abandon it too. Point taken. In the water beyond the operating table are the bodies of the people we've met in our travels. Amada, Elder Lions, Moira Brown, all lying face down and motionless. Interacting with them will cause them to dissolve, further pushing the point that we are alone, no matter how hard we try to keep them from leaving us. The final bubble hit is luck, and is found at the feet of Mr. Brake as he awaits your arrival. It reads, dead mother, life in a post-nuclear wasteland, and not a friend in it. Yeah, you aren't exactly blessed. Mr. Brake urges us to be careful getting up before the Megaton Bomb explodes, ending the hallucination. While this is absolutely a standout and memorable moment from the DLC, the hallucination and its message feel unearned. At no point in the game before this is it expressed that the Lone Wanderer feels this way, and why should it? The Lone Wanderer is whoever the player wants them to be. Having a sequence like this forces you to have a character who feels this way, despite any of your choices or actions up to that point. The feelings of loneliness and abandonment are intriguing threads to pull on, but they come across as contrived and out of nowhere. Besides, Dogmeat makes that all irrelevant. He would never leave. In that case, it could be a commentary on how no matter how much you are surrounded by loved ones, feelings of isolation or being cast off could still wiggle into your brain. I don't know, it feels forced. Having woken up from my trippy experience, I return to the Ark and Dove Cathedral, where they would accept me with open arms. They celebrate the blessings that the Mother Punga bestowed upon me. I carry now the wisdom of a giant fuck-off plant in the middle of a swamp. Lucky me. Desmond wanted me to find out what their deal was and why they insist on attacking his mansion and disturbing his work. This would mean tracking down their leader Jackson and questioning him. The tribals are cagey when asked about his whereabouts offering that his secret hideaway is something only the most devoted followers can have access to. I made my rounds, talking to each tribal member, hoping one of them would be more helpful than the rest. These discussions led me to learn more about them and their beliefs. They are a group who recognize the cruel reality of the nuclear nightmare left behind by the Great War, and seek a way to free their minds from this world. They have no delusions that they can change things, only that they can change themselves and ascend to a higher plane of existence. It's basically just a cult whose uniform show more skin, nothing wrong with that. Or at least it beats some of the other conclusions people have come to 
in the post-apocalypse, like raiders or slavers who resort to senseless violence and the complete dismissal of human rights in the absence of anyone to tell them no. Tribals don't want control, power, or wealth. They just want to be part of a world that wasn't shattered by those who were driven by their lust for those things. The tribals figured the best way to achieve that goal is by cutting chunks of their brain out and worshipping a big old fruit god. Not that I agree with them, but it's a more admirable belief than most. Remember that woman Catherine who asked me to find her daughter before I boarded the boat to Point Lookout? Yeah, me neither. Anyway, I did find her daughter inside the cathedral. Her name is Nadine and she is easily the most exciting character in the entire expansion. She ran away from home to find her fortune and make her mark in the tomes of history. Her effort toward that has brought her to Point Lookout and to join the tribal ranks. Her plan is to procure the mighty Punga for herself. She's witty, resourceful, and unwilling to put up with the nonsense buffoonery of the tribe or anyone else. Hey now, I might still be ten kinds of crazy. You don't even know me, and you can't tell just from looking. I could be friendly till she stabs you in the neck kind of crazy. Then where'd you be, smart Alec? All surprised and stabbed, that's where. <laughs> Nadine is the only one brave enough to follow the tribe's leader to his weird little hole and has no problem sharing that information with me. This is very convenient because I expected the quest to take me on some busy work bullshit to gain the tribe's favor so they would trust me with the location of their leader. Instead, Nadine simply explains everything to me. She tells us that our encounter with the mother punga wasn't just your standard run-of-the-mill garden variety drug trip. It was an opportunity for someone from the tribe to perform a rough and tumble lobotomy, removing part of our brain. The part that holds us back from ascending, they say. The things we saw during the hallucination start to make more sense now. The giant saw that cut into seemingly nothing and the needle dancing along the ground represented the operation taking place while we were unconscious. Nadine points us in Jackson's direction and gives us a key to his hideout. Rather than go straight to him, I decided to report to Desmond and update him on the situation. Don't waste your time reporting back. Go find him and figure out what he wants with this place, you moron. Okay, asshole. I'll come back later when you're not in such a pissy mood. I found Jackson's seaside cave and found him talking to a hologram projector. I appreciate the dynamic between the tribe's leader and the voice behind the hologram. Jackson is speaking as if he's humbled to be in the presence of a true deity. All wisdom comes from the transcendent master. Meanwhile, the hologram talks like someone with zero interest in playing along. Now then, perhaps you can be more useful than that The hologram is a projection of a brain and is barking orders at and berating Jackson, demanding that he tear down the jammer being used by Desmond, which keeps the hologram signal from traveling beyond the cave. The brain is disappointed in the tribals for misinterpreting his message to mean burning down the entire mansion rather than just the jamming device. I adore this. To me, it serves as a satire of someone interfacing with what they believe to be a literal god, but they're so blinded by their faith that even when the message could not be more direct, they still still muddy the waters by treating every word and request as cryptic and burdened by extra meaning. They bring their own conclusions and don't listen to what actually is being said. He asks that I take on the task of destroying the jammer. He mentions that he is one of humanity's greatest minds, preserved by the magic of science. He doesn't detail his beef with Desmond, only that it would break my puny mortal mind to even begin to understand it. Now that I'm in the middle of the scuffle between Desmond and this brain projection, I have a choice on who I want to side with. Neither of them has really given me a good reason to support them. I have yet to learn anything about what they want to accomplish in the long term. Their motives seem to lie in the age-old realm of, hey, f that guy. So it's up to preference for now, and for now, I choose Desmond, as he was the first one to talk to me, and I like his suit. He's a dick, but but so was the brain. Returning to Desmond, I told him what I saw, and he revealed that the brain is actually his old rival, Professor Calvert, whose mansion he is currently dwelling in. Their disagreement goes back to well before the bombs fell, to the point that I'm not convinced that either of them remember why they oppose each other. They both exist now just to foil each other's plans. They try to come off as the only intelligent minds in the wasteland, whose goals are beyond the comprehension of the rabble, but the truth is they're just petulant children bickering back and forth. Desmond wants me to place his gem device in the highest place, the ferris wheel at the pier. I agree to continue doing his bidding, but as I get closer to the ferris wheel, Professor Calvert begs me to throw the jammer away. He even sent some tribals to stop me. They couldn't. I fast traveled back to the mansion, and as I loaded in, it exploded. Whatever was packed there had eaten the whole house and left no crumbs. Flames crackle as the ash and embers settle on what used to be the most prominent landmark of the area. Desmond survived by taking shelter in the safe room beneath the mansion. He was pretty peeved about the whole 
whole thing, but was able to track down Professor Calvert, who was stashed away in the lighthouse behind the house the entire time, right under Desmond's nose. It's time to pay him a visit. I followed Desmond to the lighthouse, discovering it as an underground research laboratory, once used to develop methods of extracting and isolating human brains for use in robots, the process in which Professor Calvert himself took part in. While fighting through the facility, Desmond and I are confronted by turrets and robots. They were dispatched with ease. Eventually, I reach the room where Professor Calvert's brain is suspended in biogel, where the final battle can take place. Desmond and Calvert had a shouting match for a while. This is their epic struggle, culminating in one amazing climax. It's up to me to decide who to side with. It really doesn't matter who you go with. Agreeing to kill Desmond will still lead to Calvert trying to take you down, so the brain tank must be dismantled regardless of your choices. If you are annoyed with Desmond for being such an asshole, this is your chance chance to enact your revenge. Otherwise, leaving him alive doesn't change anything. You still gain access to the reward at the end, which is a unique variant of the Mesmetron called the microwave emitter. Where the Mesmetron is meant to be non-lethal, the microwave emitter is designed to burn, explode, or disintegrate a target with intense microwave radiation blasts. It's fine. The main quest could have been better. I get the feeling it was intended to be more lighthearted than any previous expansion, but that doesn't mean it couldn't have spent more time fleshing out the rivalry between Desmond and Calvert. Having a bit of comedic relief in a game that has rarely flinched in its depiction of a world still reeling from humanity doing its absolute best to destroy itself is welcome, but it still comes across as lackluster. It's not bad, I just wanted more. That is the theme with these Fallout 3 DLCs. I really don't have much more to say. It was a blur that provided very little meat to bite into. I could explore the rest of Point Lookout with the main quest in the rear view. I found another mansion, this one home to another grouchy old fart who wants some stupid book back or something. Some swamp folk stole it and wants me to get it back from their ritual site. I agreed to help because it was something to do. I went off to get his book, but was stopped by a woman who warned me of the darkness within the pages of that book. It was known as the Kerbeknev and held powerful ancient magic. I told her I would give the book to her when I found it. I was tired of helping grouchy old farts anyway. The ritual site was a creep show, decorated top to bottom with dolls, torches, and human remains. The swamp folk may not know how to read or write, but they sure know how to call upon occult forces to aid them in their endeavors. I got hold of the book after pulling it from a chalice of blood. Bethesda's artist really had some fun designing this, that's for sure. I found the woman's tent on the beach and tried dropping off the book to her. Entering her dwelling, I discovered she had been killed. A message was written on the wall in her blood, reading, Die, thief. Her last words were recorded on a hollow tape. She asked anyone who heard it to destroy the Krebeknev by bringing it to the Dunwick building in the Capital Wasteland and touching it to the obelisk in its basement, but that's a story for a different day. I came back to the riverboat where Nadine was waiting for me. She tells me she found out who was cutting people's brains out. It was Tobar, the ferryman. He even kept the brain chunks in his engine room as trophies. Nadine tied him up and locked him in there until I came around so that I could decide what to do with him. She also took over his boat and will now allow us to travel back and forth freely from DC to Point Lookout. Good for her. She was the best part of this DLC. I delivered a 44 caliber uppercut to Tobar's stupid face. My business is now concluded in this swampy hellhole. Nadine's mother was stoked to have her daughter back, and that's Point Lookout. As the most open-ended expansion brought to Fallout 3, it delivers on its promise of a brand new, mysterious world to delve into. While it doesn't have the same impact or quality as the base game, that doesn't mean it isn't a well-executed and enjoyable experience. The main quest was lacking in a lot of ways, but there were some truly standout moments. The hallucination sequence was iconic and was one of the first games that I can remember taking a swing like that. The characters were intriguing but shallow. Desmond and Professor Calvert are featured prominently, but we barely get to know them or their rivalry. It's solid all around, but a splash of more variety could have gone a long way. If nothing else, it would help contrast against the overwhelming gray bleakness of the swamp and surrounding areas. If you made it to this point in the video, consider subscribing and leaving a like to let me know you want to see more. Down below, tell me how wrong and dumb I am about Point Lookout. I hope you find the people, things, and activities around you that make you happy, healthy, and kind. Your darkest moments don't define you, and there's always a tomorrow. I'll catch you next time. Have a nice day.